The complex branching roots of humanity hold many deep and untold secrets. Ancient sites and artifacts are windows slicing through time and space. Stone tools are exciting clues to our earliest prehistoric cultures. They lie on the surface of ancient landscapes or buried within them. These silent stones hold clues to long-forgotten prehistoric minds. Decoding prehistoric ways of life is an exercise involving modern knowledge, skill and teamwork in the field and lab. Archaeological research is constantly evolving to study how stone tools were made and used. The oldest stone tools were found in East Africa and are three million years old. Stone was shaped into different forms and used for over a million years. Stone tools are priceless clues in the story of human evolution. They form an enigmatic interface between ancient minds, people, and their environments. The Ashalian prehistoric culture forms a part of the Paleolithic. It existed from around 1.7 million years ago to around 250,000 years ago. This period falls within a geological time scale called the Pleistocene. Homo erectus, the toolmakers, adapted successfully to climatic changes and diverse ecological niches. Among other stone tools, Eshelian hominins specialized in producing two distinct tools. These were the teardrop-shaped hand axe and the broad-edged cleaver. These bifacially flaked tools are symmetrical in shape and remarkably similar throughout the Eshelian world. This film brings alive the story of the cleaver. But why the cleaver? Many studies focus on the symmetry and beauty of Ashalian hand axes. Far less attention has been focused on the cleaver, a vital component of the ancient toolkit. The story of the cleaver reflects evolutionary abilities in technology, cognition, and cultural traditions. The earliest 1.75 million year old cleavers were found in East Africa. Those found at Atirampakam, India, are around 1 million to 1.7 million years old. Ashalian hunter-gatherers traveled vast distances. They moved across Africa, the Levant, Arabia, India, the Caucasus, and China. They entered Europe later on, possibly crossing the Straits of Gibraltar. Gesher Bnot Yaakov, or GBY, is one of the many fascinating Ashalian sites. It lies in the Dead Sea Rift along the Jordan River, Israel. GBY is 780,000 years old and unique in Southwest Asia with over 200 cleavers. For over 50,000 years, cleavers occur in many levels of hominin occupation at the site. This gives us a wonderful chance to look at how this tool was made and the role it played in their lives. So, what is a cleaver? How was it made and used? We seek answers by replicating the process of making or napping a cleaver. We track the life history of a tool right from selecting a suitable rock all the way to its final form, a cleaver. Cleavers were made of different raw materials, such as basalt, quartzite, limestone, flint, obsidian, and granite. These occurred as boulders, cobbles, or slabs. Archaeologists use specific terms to describe cleavers. Here we see the cleaver working edge. This is the base of the cleaver. Here we see two lateral edges. And these marks are scars of flake removals to shape the tool. Typologically, cleavers are classified by the flake characteristics, their form, working edge shape, and other parameters. The unique characteristic of the cleaver is its straight working edge. This edge lies at the junction of the flat dorsal and ventral surfaces that intersect at an acute angle. Cleaver working edges were shaped to enable an optimal shearing configuration similar to that of a butcher's knife. The edge facilitated controlled penetration. This allowed efficient slicing or cutting actions in meat or wood. Variation in shape reflects function, skill levels, and tradition. <laughs> At the quarry, 
Ashalian hominins knew exactly where suitable rocks for cores and hammerstones were located in the landscape. The selection of suitable rocks and hammerstones was vital for successfully making a cleaver. When they were satisfied, quarrying began. Sounds of the quarrying and ancient conversation fill the air. The block is shaped to enable napping. The outer rind and edges are often removed to get a rough desired shape. The core is now ready for further flaking. Hammerstones of different weights, sizes, and hardness are a key to successful napping. This is a typical break of hammerstone. To make a cleaver, one needs careful planning, drawing on experience, skill, and knowledge. Prehistoric nappers had to visualize the cleaver within the unmodified rock and in the core. They chose the most suitable method from their repertoire of techniques. They evaluated the nature of the rock to identify possible hidden defects. They flexibly resolved problems arising during this reduction sequence. Coordinated hand-eye movements were essential for the success of each flake detachment. The brain processed changing angles and surfaces, adapting to the shifting morphology of the core. These complex technological abilities demonstrate the knowledge and intelligence of Ashalian toolmakers. Here are some technological strategies to produce large flakes for making cleavers. We see these technologies at many Ashalian sites. At many sites like Geshel Bnot Yaakov, several different techniques were used simultaneously. All cleavers are made on large flakes, napped from large to giant cores. Some cores were reduced more than others. Considerable dexterity and experience is required to knock off large flakes to make cleavers. Many factors influence flake shapes. These include the angle and force of the blow, its location on the core, and position in relation to previous flake detachments. A very large core produces dozens of flakes suitable for shaping into tools. The napper carefully sorts through these flakes. He selects flakes that are morphologically suitable for shaping into cleavers. This is a very large flake. The napper uses a heavy hammerstone to detach successive large flakes. Suitable flakes that still retain cortex can also be shaped into cleavers, just like this one. We will uh, retouch it yeah. over here. Yeah. Let us have a look at some methods for producing large flakes. The cores are flaked bifacially. One flake scar serves as the striking platform for the next detachment. This process is repeated sequentially. Kombewa cores. This technology involves detaching a very large flake from a core. Then the flake was used as a core to detach a predetermined flake. I'm trying to create a platform and then I'll give a blow somewhere here and that should be okay. Many of the cleavers are made on Kombewa flakes. You actually see two ventral faces. We have a striking platform, a bulb of percussion, and a lenticular cross-section. The shearing area is okay, everything is ready. Slicing technology. Using another technology, cores could be sliced continuously to detach suitable thin flakes. This technique had several variations. Further flaking could shape the tool into the desired form. In addition to these methods, there are many other technologies. And you have a lovely edge here. Beautiful. Level Wa cores. Such cores are pre-planned and prepared to a greater extent than others. We are aiming to a level Wa cleaver from this large boulder. Specific technological strategies are followed here. These cores have a series of flake removals all along the circumference, which helps in organizing the core volume to detach a predetermined large flake. Now you are at the stage that you want to get rid of the cortex before you give the last blow for the predetermined flake. These problems were actually part of early hominins when they faced the same problems. Yeah. 
this one was going to be a cleaver and it was going to be there from the moment that the person struck the big flake. So it comes off the core like that and this edge has to be caught at that moment because you can't make it later on. They knew in advance and they decide it's one step, just like that. I think they were very sophisticated technically. Uh, they were expert stone knappers. Um, they organized the world in a very effective way. They were using expert cognition. And this is a form of cognition that we still use today when we make and use tools. Now that we have a large predetermined flake, let us explore how hominins shape the flake into a cleaver. The cleaver has to have a wedge-like morphology at its distal end, forming the cutting edge of the tool. In order to obtain this particular configuration, the napper has several options. This is a Levallois flake. You can see that the directions of the previous scars on the core. This is the edge because it's straight and has uh, two faces. If I flip it over, I can see the striking platform and the bulb of percussion and the direction of the energy inside the flake. There are two options used to shape a Kombewa cleaver. The first was to leave the distal end unworked. The natural biconvexity of the Kombewa flake was ideally suited for the cleaver morphology and distal working edge shape. The second option was to retouch the tool on one face to produce the required biconvexity. Can you reduce this? You start flicking from here, this way, this way. Delineated. We have a Kombewa flake. We see one surface of the ventral face. This is another ventral face, striking platform, the bulb of percussion another striking platform, another bulb of percussion, and the cleaver working surface, which is delineated by a retouch all over here. A triangular, unretouched Kombewa surface was retained at the distal working edge. The base of the triangle was the working edge. The vertex formed the farthest point from the edge, generally located at the thickest part of the flake. On achieving the overall shape of the cleaver, distal or cutting edge, the napper began to retouch the tool. He could choose to retouch both lateral edges and the base. I will shape from along this line and along this line and I'll make it a little rounded. Ventral surfaces were retouched to thin the striking platform and the convexities of the bulb of percussion. This is a classical cleaver. When you flip it over, you can see that the striking platform was removed. Hominins selected either one or both faces to retouch. Ashalian cleavers at GBY have minimal retouch, confined to one or both edges. Cleavers made on large flakes disappeared from the Levantine Ashalian sites and in most parts of the world around half a million years ago. In India, few cleavers continue into the early middle Paleolithic around 300,000 years ago. Why did cleavers disappear? Or did they? The modern butcher's knife, in particular, is the best analogy to the cleaver. The large, straight working edge of the cleaver and its wedge-like morphology is ideal for meat processing. The cutting edge of our cleaver slices through time and space. Its complex technology implies sophisticated planning and expertise. Traditions of making cleavers were taught and shared over thousands of generations. Did this communication require full language abilities? Does it suggest more modern behavior than we presume? We leave you behind with a world where sounds of stone on stone filled the air, where nappers shared tips and tricks to master rocks, and where function and beauty were united in stone.